What's up? This is Van Lathan's The Red Pill, where we give you the brutal reality of truth. Today's guest, special guest, Demetrius Harmon, better known to people that follow him on Twitter and Instagram as Meech on Mars. His brother has amassed millions upon millions of views uh, for his funny videos and the skits that he does. Huge, huge, huge online following. We're going to talk to him today about his struggles with mental health, about how he has helped people cope in dealing with the stigma of mental health and about Beyonce's ass. And why is everybody so upset about Beyonce's ass? I don't get it. Meech doesn't get it. Hopefully, y'all get it at the end of this podcast. Pop some pills. Let's get into it. Are we rolling? Yeah, we're rolling. Hey, welcome. <laughs> we were already mid-conversation. <laughs> we were in mid-conversation. Me and Meech or Demetrius Harmon. I, I, I can't call you Meech You anymore. can call me Meech, though. That's my name. That's Dem- it's like Demetrius. Right. Rhea, so that comes from my name. Right. But on Mars is no longer me. Meech on Mars is no longer you. Okay, first of all, give it up for Demetrius Harrison. Harmon. Harmon. Excuse me. Demetrius Harmon. And listen, if y'all thinking, why does Van have somebody on his podcast? He don't even know his name. He had a stage name, but I've just been informed that the stage name you are retiring and you're going by your real name, which is Demetrius Harmon. Why are you? First of all, if you guys don't know him, you're close to a million followers on Twitter, right? You have 750 or 60,000. And like you, you're someone that has done a bunch of different skits. You have a the thing I like about you is you have you obviously got your movement started with um, putting out funny skits, funny videos, and things like that. But mm-hmm. it's moved past that. It's moved past that into you know people looking up to you uh, for things that you stand for, for some of your mental health things that you that you do with people. And it seems like your fan base has really glommed onto you, and you're like a symbol and a representative of them. Yeah, that's yeah. my favorite thing too, because like. People come, I'm very emotional. And people come to me all the time like, yo, you saved my life. And I just be sitting there like, wow. And I start crying. Like, yeah. I've cried in front of fans very frequently because it's different for to read a tweet or like read something where someone's telling you something very heartfelt. Mm-hmm. But for someone to come up to you and you you can physically like see them and like really see how much you mean to them and feel it, mm-hmm. it's completely different. When, first of all, let's go back over the name, your career. We'll come back to the name. Okay. When did you start making videos and when did it start first start becoming something that you felt like people were gravitating towards? I started making videos my eighth grade summer. Yeah. So when I was 14. Uh, but I, I was on Tumblr and I had like 3,000 followers on Tumblr mm-hmm. for just, you know, like Tumblr and things like just reblogging and stuff like that. And then I really was just doing it for fun. It was just something I liked doing. So I didn't even like when I had like 15 viewers. To me, that was a lot. That was enough because 15 viewers is 15 people. Right. And it was consistent. And I was consistently uploading on Mondays. I had, like, Meech Mondays. Mm-hmm. And it's just something to keep me going. Because I, I went to the same school from second grade to eighth grade. So I was used to a community. Mm-hmm. And then compared to leaving that to go into a completely fresh school in ninth grade where I didn't know anyone was, like, a lot for me. So doing the YouTube videos kept me kind of sane. The art me. helped you cope a little bit with being outside of your surroundings. Or yeah, whatever. yeah. It does that, man. It really does. It gives you a place to kind of dive into. Yeah. Yeah. So how old are you now? 20. Freshly 20. I like saying so freshly 20. So when you say you're freshly 20, what year were you born? March. I mean, I was March, born March 1st, 1998. I graduated from high school in <laughs> May of 1998. That's ridiculous. So give it up for this little nigga. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> clap right now for Meech because he's young. Made it. <laughs> wow, um, bro, I'm proud of you. Like, like I'm just saying, man. The, Wait, where's the camera? I do, I do a deadpan all the time. Yeah, like I'm, I'm proud of you, dog. Like you, you really have found your voice. Uh, when was it that you start to realize, wow, people are really enjoying these videos that I do, and they're coming to rely on them um, for their entertainment and for like you know guidance and stuff like that. I would say ninth grade year, like when I first started doing it, it's really weird because perspective changes. When I would look back at my old videos and how many views they had, I'm like, that's not that many compared to what I do now. Right. How many views do you get on the video now when you do the videos? It depends. It goes anywhere from like a million to like, because I post mostly on Twitter compared to YouTube. Right. So video, you know, with Twitter, it's easier to go viral and for things to spread because they have retweet. Right. And so if say if I post something on YouTube, we can get 200, 300,000 views. But if I post it on Twitter, it can get 2 million or 3 million just because people are retweeting. Wow. 
wow, I was telling him the first video I saw was this video that he did was like he set the scene of what it must have been like when uh, Beyonce was playing Lemonade for Jay-Z. And I watched that video and I was like, because, you know, you're out here in Los Angeles and you're around a bunch of creatives. You're around mm -hmm. people who write, act, and they do all of these things. And there's, certain, there's subtle things about watching somebody that um, either they have it or they don't. Yeah. There's nuance to art, right? There's nuance to making somebody laugh. And just in some of the, the and it's you playing both roles. <laughs> it's you playing Beyonce and Jay-Z. And I'm like, yo, man, this kid is mad talented. What do you feel like um, your fans expect from you? Like, because now I've seen you you do some of the mental health stuff. You, mm. you, you Is it the, the Vine thing kind of went away? No one's doing that anymore. Yeah. Um, and even like a lot of the funny videos and the, the skits and stuff like that, it's just not as hot as it once was. Like, what do you feel like your fans have come to expect from you now? Me to be whatever it is that I want to be. Mm -hmm. They really, I like that the most about them. They support whatever I want to do. Like, if I would tell them I'm dropping a video, they're like, ecstatic about it if i tell them i'm dropping a playlist they're ecstatic about it if i tell them i'm doing a poem book they're happy about it so really whatever i want to be there happy to support it mm. but i'm all i do all the same things just is when it, whatever mood i wake up in you know if i don't feel like recording a funny video mm. and i may upload a video that's just in, insight you know telling them that everything is gonna be okay or if i write a poem i'll upload that right one video that i saw that you did it was one where you were having a panic attack. Yeah. And I have dealt with panic attacks since I was a little bit older than you. Mm -hmm. Because when I was born, I was older than you. You like I've, I've never been as young as what you are right now. Um, uh, so um, I guess I was around 22 or 23 when I first had uh, <laughs> a really bad panic attack. We were on our way to see... My cousin, Glenn Davis, mm. um, he was playing in the basketball game. I was riding in the car. My Glenn boy Davis? Ride. Yeah, big baby. <laughs> why, why, why is that funny? Why, 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 is, why is that funny? That's so random. Like, you, that's, like, that's like a Snapple fact. Like, right, it's, like, it's my cousin. Van <laughs> Lathan is related to Glenn Davis. That's right, so it's random. my cousin, man. It's, it's my cousin. Like, yeah. Like, like big baby, like Celtics. You were from the same place. Like, I don't know where Big Baby's from. He's from the... Baton Rouge. Like he's my cousin. Okay, that did, uh, why would I think? Okay, he's I know, from Baton Rouge. You're I know, Baton but like, but I say that he's my cousin, and you like, damn, I felt a certain way about that. That's it's my family, family, man. <laughs> right. no, I'm just fucking around. Okay, but yeah, you were headed to. So we're, we're going to a uh, <laughs> we're going to a, a, a basketball game to watch him play basketball, and um, we smoking weed. We in the car. Shout out to Ryan Davenport. We smoking weed. And I hit the weed and I'll lay back and I fall asleep for like two minutes. And when I wake up, my heart's beating like super fast. Yeah. And we stop at this little town in Louisiana called Bro Bridge. Mm -hmm. And we stop at the town and we go in there and my heart's beating fast and it won't slow down. By this point, uh, if you've never had a panic attack before, there is no way for anyone to convince you that you're not going to die. Mm hmm all right, like you, hundred percent. Uh, there's no way for anyone to convince you you're not gonna die. So my heart's beating super fast. I'm sweating. My heart won't slow down. I'm gonna go ahead and out Ryan a little bit. Ryan is crying at this point now, <laughs> my boy. Because he's, he's never scared seen. For you. He's scared for me. And first responders have showed up. And everybody's coming and stuff like that. And all I hear is, okay, get the chopper. So I'm actually, I actually get airlifted. Uh, that's crazy. From Bro Bridge uh, to the hospital. Right. And of course, as it goes with a lot of panic attacks, by the time I get to the hospital, I've calmed down. Yeah. So um, when I saw the video, because in the video you're having a panic attack and someone comes over to you and it deals with the way that sometimes in our community we deal with stuff like that. Because the first thing that you, the, the, the person told you in the video is, why don't you pray about it? Right. Yeah. I hate that. And. It's not that we don't want to pray about stuff. It's not that I don't want to take stuff to God, but it's like, yo. This is happening right now. This is like, it, it's like, <clears throat> I remember my mom my mom being like, you know, that's a spirit. And I'd be like, okay, mama. <laughs> <laughs> what's the next thing? You know what I'm saying? I'm what like, do I like, do about yeah, this? Like, 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 what, what, like, what's the next thing? And they started coming like over and over and over again. What was your experience with sort of... Uh, that you know and, and how do you 
Well, first of all, let's just start with that. What was your experience with it? When did you start dealing with it? Uh, I started dealing with, I was diagnosed with severe anxiety when I was in, I want to say eighth grade. Mm -hmm. A lot of things were going on. With, wow, that young, huh? Yeah, and if it was, I was diagnosed with hypoglycemia and anxiety around the time, and that's like when I started figuring out I was really depressed. Mm -hmm. Like, and acknowledging that it was depression and I wasn't just sad. Yeah. And like, you know, because we don't talk about it. And I, like, with me talking about it now, I didn't have anyone to look up with towards it. Mm -hmm. You know, like kids may have now, but I was in school and I was just really like thinking about the things that were going on at home. And I just remember starting to shake and I couldn't breathe. And everyone was just looking at me very funny, like, like breathe. And I'm like, I, I can't. Yeah. And then I just started like shaking and then I passed out. Wow. See, I've never actually passed out from one. When you came to, where were you at? I was in the office. Okay. And then not much time had passed, but it felt like forever. Yeah. Like, it was really dark. Right. So at this point, do you go and you get diagnosed with something? Do, do, do they send counselors in to talk to you? Cause, like, how, how did that work being so young? They didn't really, not, I don't want to say they didn't care, but you know, like, same with the fact that we're a lot more open just as a, and in the world about mental health and paying attention to it now, mm -hmm. back then they didn't really know what to do. So it was just like, oh, he has anxiety. Okay. What do you want us to do about that? All right. Did yeah. they medicate you? They gave me Ativan. Right. Yeah, my doctor gave me Ativan. Mm -hmm. But I didn't like Ativan because with me being a creative, just back then, like even before I did videos, I, I've, writ I've written poetry since I was in third grade. Mm -hmm. And just my mind was always like, you know, racing and just... I like it like that. I like being able to think things and feel things. Right. And so with taking the antidepressants on the Ativan, mm -hmm. it shut my mind off. Right. And so I would just be looking at things and I don't have an opinion. I don't have a thought. And I was like, this is not okay. I don't it's like weird. this. Yeah. So then that's, I stopped taking them and just kind of focused on more so trying to learn how to deal with it myself. Mm. Uh, they put me on Zoloft at first and I remember they used to give me the little like the little sample packages of the Zoloft, right? Because mm -hmm. I had that panic attack, and then I started having a panic attack a day uh, for as long as uh, just they happened every day. Mm -hmm. It it got to the point to where I I have them. I, have, I was working at Best Buy at the time, and you know I was at work with a halter monitor on. They were trying to monitor my heart, make sure everything was okay. And I would have a panic attack, and the paramedics would come and they would rush over to the Best Buy. And then I would get home and I would have one, and it would be the same paramedics, and they would be like, "Yo, man." Like, what are you going to do about this? Like, this is a, this is a, a, this is a, a this recurring is, issue. Yeah, yeah, this is a thing. But I remember, what I remember about the Zoloft is that, like, I, they gave me the Zoloft, and right away, there, st there starts to be, like, after a couple of days of taking it, like, you start to feel a little bit less, like, like, the panic attacks come, even when your anxiety wells up, you feel your body, like, level out, right? Because mm -hmm. of the medicine that's in your system. But, conversely, you cannot bust a nut to save your life. <laughs> why is like why is, where is it like like where I'm did like, this go? You can't like you cannot bust a nut to save your life. I'm sitting in front of the computer. Right? <laughs> it's Big Booty Oil Overload Four. It's just why do you me, that's not the name yeah, of it. That was Big Booty Oil. That was not the name look of up it. the movie right now. I promise. No, don't look up it's, the movie. No one pull out your phones, please. It's me and sitting there, and I'm like, yo, is this thing on? Like, is anything gonna happen? And the doctor goes, oh. Yeah, I That's forgot a side to effect. tell you, there are some sexual side effects. I was like, guess what? Get me off of this. So like, how were you during this time? I was 24. Oh, I'm sorry, dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking like, oh, like you're like my, like you're like 60. You no, know what I'm saying? Like, no, no, you're a grown man. I was grown. Yeah, I'm sorry, to, like, dog. Everybody was out the house. Because, you know, every once in a while, yeah. you need some alone you time. But I was living with, I was living with my boy Ian, his wife, their baby, and all that stuff like that. And I'd be like, listen. I, I've been really, you know, living Tense. over here for a long time. I'm like, listen, man, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send y'all out to the movies. I'm going to pay for a movie day for y'all. Y'all go, <laughs> go see The Incredibles and some shit like that. As soon as they leave, I'm there, but the mental fucking health medicine, the Zoloft, is in my system. And also, it's just a whole bunch of other things that you don't want to be medicated. How long were you on the medication that you were taking before you realized that it wasn't something that you wanted to be on? It was about... As long as the situation like that caused my anxiety, uh, what so was probably the, like two. What, what was it? There was a root cause. For it you? was like yeah, it was like a my dad and my brother. My I'm I'm my father's only biological child. Sure, but then so he raised my brother from probably like I think when he was like one. Right, and so they got into it over like a scuffle and got into a fight. But around that time is when my brother had my niece, and I was really like attached to my niece because I I was 
there for her like when she was born and like stayed around her and all that stuff or whatever so i couldn't see her and then so just thinking about that and thinking about i'm really family oriented mm-hmm. and then so just thinking about like the direction our family was going in and that, like really overthinking with the fact that i thought i was never going to see my brother again or never see my niece again never mm-hmm. see my nephew again or that my family was never going to be whole again jesus really, so much for a 14 year old to take man yeah it's a lot and then there's a all like my my godmom was murdered when I was in fifth grade. Wow. Like a lot of a lot of things I think caused my anxiety as far as the uncertainty of life. Mm-hmm. Like I, I really became and that's what led to my depression as well, with how uncertain life is. There's I could really wake up and someone could be gone. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And and that's a possibility every second and you're, of the and day. You're, you're young and you're just coming to terms with those realities around that time. Yeah, and I was like around because my I had never dealt with a I dealt with a lot of loss. Loss is really, I think, what caused me to have my anxiety and my depression. So I was on, to answer the question, I was on the pills for probably like two, three months. Mm-hmm. And then just not, not every day, because my anxiety tests were every day, and I, I would feel anxious mm-hmm. every day, but I just would try. After like the first two, three days of using it, I was like, I don't like this, so let me try not to. Which is the worst possible thing that you can do. You are. If you're going to take, if you're going to be on the medicines, like right now we're sitting here, I'm on Lexapro. Mm-hmm. Um... Uh, people that work here at TMZ, you guys might not remember, but there was a situation about a year and a half ago mm. to where I missed almost a month of work. Um, and I missed that because um, I just broke. I kind of passed out here in the office a little bit. And um, when I passed out, I got super dizzy and I fell. And it was like the same thing. It was like being right back in the situation that I was in before. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this time the symptoms were physical and stuff like that. And so I felt like for me personally, being an older man now uh, that the medication was something that could be beneficial and helpful, but it's very mm-hmm. important that if you're going to take those medications, that you don't fuck around with the dosage, which mean be on them one day and be on off them yeah. the next day. You have to take them and let them build up into your system. And then you have to really be regimented about taking them and mm-hmm. about getting off of them. And sometimes, uh, especially where I was from, the, the doctor's, they're, you know, we didn't grow up in New York and L.A. Yeah. Where people are coming to the doctors all the time saying, yo, something's messed up in my head. Yeah. If you grew up in Detroit, they're like, you grew up in yeah. Rooms, <laughs> <laughs> they're like, yo, son, something's wrong with you. Take a couple of these. You know what I'm saying? But like they, they, there's, a, there's a way to be on those and there's a way to be off of them. Yeah. Do, did you feel um, after you got off of the medication uh, that there were people around you to give you the sort of strategic, the st- strategic, the strategies and the coping mechanisms that you needed to deal with this, or did you have to figure it out yourself? I would say my mom was there a lot. Like mm-hmm. I, I, my mom was just there to talk to me, even if she didn't have the answers. Mm-hmm. We kind of figured it out together, you know, like having right. that support. But a lot for myself was figuring it out because even I didn't know that you weren't supposed to do that. So yeah. now that you mentioned it, I was like a, a very like... Uh, You're not even supposed to skip a day. See, yeah, I wouldn't know that because it's like they just give it to you. There was no instructions like take these. Right. You know what I'm saying? So take it. It was kind of... I was told not even taking it once a day. I was told to take it whenever I felt. Oh, well, that might be, I might be wrong. It depends, it? On, it depends on the type of medication because I don't want to speak out of turn because I, I have Xanax for whenever I, I'm about to have something. Yeah. Like, and so it's different. Right. So, yeah, if you're on the SSRI, like a Zoloft or a Lexapro or something like that, then you might be on it a little bit longer term. Like, mm-hmm. I take it once a day. Maybe they want to get you on something once a day because yeah. you were so young. So I could be wrong about that. But even with taking it and not taking it, I became very what is the word i can't think of the word but i was very aggressive mm. like because i would i would go from yeah my i'm very like calm i would usually be very calm and just like you know to myself but i think with going from feeling everything and thinking overthinking everything to feeling nothing and then going back and forth like just that back and forth really messed with my my mood and my emotion i had a lot of mood swings mm. and stuff like that but um what's the lowest you ever got the lowest yeah what do you mean like, well, when was it the hardest? What's the hardest times that you've dealt with sort of the mental health things? Like, what's what's the... what's Specifically the worst? anxiety or just mental health in general? Either way. Uh, every time someone passes away, my grand, my auntie passed away mm-hmm. in 11th grade? Yeah, she passed away and it, she passed away before I was supposed to go see her. The problem that I have with when people pass, I'm, it's always right before I'm seeing them. Right. So my like my grandpa my grandfather passed away he passed away in the hospital, 
And then so I beat myself up about it because I didn't go see him while he was in the hospital because I was like, I don't want to see him like that. Right. He just had pneumonia. I was like, he's not. He's going to make it out. Right. Didn't. And then when my godma passed away, I just had met her like two weeks before that. Mm. Like I spent like three days with him and she was like an angel, you know, like because I didn't know her, but she's my parents' best friend. Right. So, you know, of course she knows of me and she's treating me like she was just treating me very nice. Right. And so I had a really good connection with her. And the next thing I know, she's gone. Yeah. You know, so but I would say the worst times it was was throughout all of those deaths, like dealing with it and learning how to move past them. But my aunt really, it really, really bothered me. And my great grandmother really, really bothered me mm. because my aunt, like I said, I was supposed to go see her. But then also with the fact that she was like my number one fan, you know, like I didn't tell people, I didn't tell my people outside of my family that I was doing videos because I cursed so much. Right, and right, was, right. And I was young, but just as a person, I was really shy. Mm. So this was completely different from the meets that they knew, you know. It's, I'm really reserved when they see me. I'm just, you know, sweet. And then they go to the internet. I'm like, fuck this, fuck that, right, bitch, right, right, nigga. Right, you know what I'm right. saying? So it's like, <laughs> and I wanted them to be proud of me, and I didn't know if that was something that they would be proud about. And so I didn't tell my aunt for a long time to do videos until it, it came to a point where, she, like, my cousin would be telling her friends, like, Micho Mars is my cousin. Mm -hmm. And she's like, who is Micho Mars? And then she would tell them, like, oh. And then, you know, she made the connection and stuff like that. But then when my grandmother passed away, we were supposed to go. My grandmother had dementia. And my grandmother had dementia, so she didn't remember me, but um, we were supposed to go see her before, because like, we knew she was unhealthy, and like we knew it was getting to like, that kind of that point. Mm -hmm. And then so we were supposed to go see her, but what we did was we went on vacation first in Alabama. So we went to a beach house to see like the rest of my side of the family. I said Alabama. And then we were supposed to drive to go see her in Bessemer. And then the... This is really emotional. Um, it's okay. The... The last day when we were um, at the beach house, my dad and my mom came into my room and they were like, my dad's crying. Like, my dad is crying. Like, not even crying. Like, you know when you're in trouble and, like, you just, you just stand there with your mom and she's, like, your mom just whooped you, but she know, like, she shouldn't have whooped you that hard, so she's kind of just consoling you as well. Yeah. My dad was standing there like a little kid next to my mom, and I'm like, what? Right. And I sit up. And she's like, you're also great. not used to seeing that from him. Yeah, I'm not used because my dad, like, with with dealing with my emotions and me being very emotional, my dad was really it was really hard for him to understand it. Like yeah. combating with me wanting to be with me being suicidal, mm -hmm. my dad was kind of like the antagonist of it. Mm -hmm. You know, like whenever I would think of talking, to, I never talked to him about it. I talked to my mom about it. So seeing him being so vulnerable was new. So I'm like, something really is wrong. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, yeah, your grandmother passed away, and that's my great grandmother. So it's his grandma. Mm -hmm. And then just the fact that literally, like, in six hours we were supposed to go see her right. really, like, messed me up. So moving forward from that and, like, not thinking we live just to lose. You right. know, we live. I'm, I'm living and loving these people just to lose them. Like, right. that's what I kept thinking. You know, like, from fourth, my, in fourth grade, my cousin committed suicide. In fifth grade, my grandmother, my godmother got murdered. In seventh grade, my grandfather passed away. And then yeah. 11th grade... 10th grade, 10th grade or 11th grade, my, I think 10th grade is when my grandmother passed away, 11th grade years when my aunt So these are away. your formative years where you're developing and exploring and cementing your ideas about life. Yeah. And you're just dealing with all of this loss. Yeah, and I'm dealing with loss. And I'm like, why? There's so much loss. Why am I even here to deal with this? Right. You know, so it's like, is this what life is about? Right. And it's, you know, like learning now that it's it's a... It's a balancing act, you know, there's sure. good moments, but we never think, in the midst of the bad moments, we can't think of the good moments. You know what's funny is my father used to tell me this is what life was about. My dad would be like, uh, it, it's such a, a fatalistic view of the world that I was brought up with, and I think that's kind of what contributed to it for me, is like, I remember uh, we were watching The Terminator, and we're watching The Terminator, and I remember this was when everything started kind of getting cemented in my head. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're watching The Terminator, we're watching the movie, and Arnold Schwarzenegger is killing all of these people. And I was thinking to myself, yo, dad, like, what happens when you die? And he goes, what? I'm like, yo, what happens when you, go, when you die? And, I'm, and he goes, uh, well, I mean, if you're good, you go to heaven, and if you're bad, you go to hell. I go, okay, cool. <clears throat> all right. So... A couple of weeks after that, my brother um, is talking about like, because I'm old. He's talking about <laughs> Ronald Reagan. And my brother says, "My brother says, listen, hey, my brother's a little bit older than me. He goes, listen, they better figure out 
everything that's going on with the United States and Russia, or else uh, there's going to be a big nuclear war and everyone's going to die. Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, I said, Dad, well, there's no possible way heaven could take all of those people coming in at once. So what happens if there's a nuclear war? And my dad goes, no big deal. We just go back to being cowboys and Indians again. And I'm asking all of these complex questions. And a simple answer. And I'm not getting any real answers. Yeah. And there are no real answers, right? Yeah. But I'm not getting anything <clears throat> that I can glom <clears throat> onto. So I'm obsessing. I'm obsessing. I'm asking everybody. Like we had to draw pictures in the. How sec- old were you during this time? I was a kid. I'm like seven, eight years old. We had to draw pictures in uh, like the second grade, mm. and just draw a picture of whatever, and you enter them in this contest. And the picture that I drew was of an American soldier and of a, a Russian soldier hugging, mm-hmm. because I had that much fear of nuclear war. Yeah. Then it went from there to the ozone layer, and it went from there to the Gulf War. I was just obsessing and obsessing and obsessing and obsessing, and I could not stop thinking about all of these things that my brain could not deal with, right? Yeah. And I was writing essay-length stories trying to deal with this stuff, and my father told me, my, my dad, who has a very simple way of putting things to me, he said, like, life is to be enjoyed. You're going to have a lot of enjoyments and stuff like that. But he said, the majority of your life is going to be about how you bounce back and deal with things that are not so good that happen. Yeah. And he, he's like, you're going to have to understand whether it's going to be faith, whether there's going to be whatever it is that you <clears throat> do, how to not get overwhelmed by bad things that happen. Mm-hmm. He goes, when your Uncle Gent passed away, who was like his hero, mm-hmm. he's like, I had to remember that in order for me, uh, if, if I go down, then like I'm going to take you with me. So I have to grieve and I have to learn how to grieve. Yeah. And I had a father to teach me that. And sometimes I wonder about um, brothers from my neighborhood who are dealing with all the loss, Mm -hmm. who are dealing with homies and big homies and cousins and aunties and people like that. They're losing them all the time and not even just losing them to death, losing them to jail, losing them to drug addiction. And no one's teaching them how to cope with that loss. Because they don't view it as that. Like, I I remember they were talking about when they first started having the discussion of why you know, like, hood niggas, like, smoke so much or drink and lean and, like, running towards drugs. Yeah. It's to numb their pain from, like, all of this loss, but we're not taught to de- how to deal with those things. We're not taught to look at it in a sense of, you know, like, griefing. We're just taught to get past it, sweep it under the rug. And that's, like, the biggest problem within our community. Yeah. When did your when did your fan base start reaching out to you and start... When did sort of the, the issues that you've had in your personal life start resonating with them when they started to be like yo because i see now i I remember when i was looking at your shit like people really they look up to you like they (laughs) fucking adore you like it's a real like people that like they want to protect you and they they they, they, you guys seem interlinked like when when did that kind of thing start to happen well i forget when i it all started when i first opened up about being suicidal and depression and stuff like that but I forget when exactly that was. Describe the feeling for people of what, when you say you're suicidal, what does that mean? Well, there's a lot of days, like, <clears throat> even now, where I wake up and I'm like, I don't want to be here. Like, I don't, mm. I, like, I don't want to be alive and I find purpose. You know, like, and since how you were saying, like, your dad was saying that if he goes down, he takes you with him. Yeah. That's how I feel about them. You know, like, I feel like, and my mom and all these other people that, not they depend upon me, but, you know, like, I like say for example, I walked into the bathroom. The reason I the, the way I explained to my parents about me being suicidal, so my mom, and my dad got into it, and then so my mom's in the bathroom. There's no shower, like the shower's not on. I'm in her room, like laying in the bed, because her bed is the most comfortable bed in the house. Mm-hmm. And so, I'm I'm realizing like okay, after like 20 minutes, there's no shower running. She's just in the bathroom. There's no noise. There's nothing. So I start knocking on the door. The door is locked. She never locks the bathroom door because their bathroom door is janky. So then I'm like, okay. And with me being like, this is before anyone in my family knows that I was dealing with suicide, that I was self harming, and these things. So me just knowing how I am and where I go when I get into that mind state, I get really anxious, and that's that. That was in the midst of me being at uh, the beginning of me having anxiety. So I start knocking on the door. I'm kicking on the door, and she like answers, but it's like very weak. My mom was a very strong woman, so it was very weak. And it's like, yeah. And I'm like open the door she's like okay and she does she like give me a second she doesn't open the door 
I'm down banging on the door, and she finally opens it, and she tells me she was um. She wanted to kill herself, hmm. and so that's why I tell her like, to tell her she's not alone. You know what I'm saying? Like, I told I opened up to my mom about me being suicidal to let her know that she because ima- imagine me and my generation feeling like I was alone and that this is taboo. I know the generation she comes from is those who thought she's it's tenfold. You know, she feels like she sh- definitely shouldn't be having those thoughts, right. and so she felt alone. So then. Now that's why I share so much with them because I feel like, you know. There's kids out there that might be in the same situation. Yeah, so, but also to answer your question, when I say being suicidal, it's just with the same feeling how we were saying being overwhelmed with the the things that come with life, you know. And, and with me being a, I'm a, I believe I'm an empath, so I feel everything. I feel like, even when you were just talking about your first anxiety attack, I start tearing up because I was in, like, I could feel it. Mm-hmm. I could feel how you felt in that moment. And so when things happen in the world, like the uh, the Vegas shooting, mm-hmm. you know, like I literally think about like there's these are souls, these are people, and they're gone. Yeah, they're gone. Like I ma- I imagine how many people would be, how many people in my family, my immediate family, would be affected about me pa- me being murdered. Mm-hmm. And I think about how many people were involved in that, how many people were murdered, how many people were hurt in that, how many people were just worried throughout that entire night about their child coming home or their loved one coming home and not making it home. And it really, like, it puts word, the world into a perspective that I don't like viewing it in. Mm. Because it's like... Are you in therapy? No, but I wanted to find a therapist out here. Mm. I really want to find a therapist out here. So my, ther- my therapist taught me something. Um, it's very, like, the good thing about therapy is this. The good thing about therapy is that there are very simple things that you can do, right? Mm-hmm. That, like, actually work. You know what I mean? And I remember I was doing yoga therapy because there's a, something called yoga therapy that you could do. And it is. It's like you do, you're doing yoga, but you're having a therapy session at the same time. So it's, you're doing yoga with your therapist? You're doing yoga with your therapist. <laughs> and, and the therapist is like, <coughs> and, like, and, you're, and it's, they're teaching you how to breathe. Mm-hmm. Breathing That's very important. It's so important. They're teaching you how to breathe. They're teaching you uh, techniques to sort of elevate yourself. And you're also getting something that's physical. And I was telling my 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 therapist, the yoga therapist, like how I um how I take walks. Anybody that works here knows that a couple of times a day I gotta get out the office. I just take a walk. I mm-hmm. walk around. And she goes, Next time you walk, look up into the sky. You don't look into the sky? You never do that? I didn't used to. It's the best thing you could ever she do. She would be she would like, next time you walk, look up. Don't look directly out. She's like, when you're a child, the first thing that you do when you get to the world is you start looking up in the sky. <laughs> so you start connecting with something that's higher than you, even if it's just the sky. Mm-hmm. And as you get older, you start looking more towards the next problem yeah. that's coming your way. Mm-hmm. She's like, look up and just let yourself go for a little while. And another thing that that same therapist told me was have thoughts that are converse of the negative thoughts mm-hmm. and, and, and that's and that's weird but she goes um don't think about what would happen if something were to happen to you or mm-hmm. if someone happened think about how proud you're going to make the people around you when you attain the goals that you attain yeah think about how happy your mom's going to be when she comes to see you the next time think about how uh filled up people are going to be think about the next time you do something charitable when you leave and you don't get to see that person's reaction yeah. and you give them whatever that is, think about how they felt. Think about how the good deed that you're going to do next is going to impact somebody before you do it. Yeah. And <clears throat> that like the feeling of I think a lot of times I think a lot of what we're what we're seeing right now with people and their mental health, maybe not so much with you, but we live in a culture right now that's so obsessed with. Um, how you can present yourself. Mm-hmm. You forget about sometimes how dope it feels to do something legitimate for somebody else. Yeah, it's the best feeling ever. It makes you feel better. It makes you feel better because it you really know does. that your existence matters because somebody else got some joy out of it. I was telling my my um, my uncle, I've, I've seen my uncle for the first time since I started doing videos. Mm-hmm. He lives in Atlanta, so I, I don't see him very frequently. Right. And so he's like, you know, how do you feel when people come up to you? I'm like, 
the best thing that mm, ever could happen to that me. That you've touched someone. Yeah, because they could people, you know, people come up to me and they're like, oh my God, I'm so happy to see you. And like they make my day better, but I know I make they, their 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 day better. Mm -hmm. And just being able to, like you said, know that my existence matters to someone. Mm -hmm. Cause a lot of times we we cave into ourselves and we tell her like, you know, the dark thoughts come, creep in and tell us that we don't matter and things like that. And so I really I really wish people would learn to uh, not approach people but just see people as human you know like yeah. just in general you know like opening the door for someone and not being scared to have a conversation with that person you know like or just normal things you know like say when people um there's kids like there's uh you know like when they're passing out chocolates and stuff like that they're like outside of the stores and they're selling candies for the schools there was this girl and she was selling candy and she was like you know do you want any candy i'm like how much is it she said she told me the price but i didn't want any candy because i'm lactose intolerant she only had chocolate <laughs> That lactose, no, that's death. That's fucked up. I would have died. I know. I would have died. So, brothers, we got the problem with the lactose, man. Everyone's lactose. That's We're not supposed to be with, drinking cow titty that's juice. Something, that's something for uh, Jason over there. Jason over here, I don't know if you know, Demetrius. Jason is the whitest man on earth. How? I see and it in him. I you, see it. You, can look, you look over at Jason and you There's know. a Snoop Dogg shirt on. I, I take that completely back. No, no. Oh, wait. Austin, you're not Jason? Austin is Who's different. Jason? Austin is actually okay. <laughs> uh, uh, Austin is different Jason Like you can look at him And tell how much He likes to drink Whole milk You like whole milk? Just wake up in the Do morning Do you like warm milk at night? Yeah till exactly With no sugar That's not good really funny. Uh, When I was a kid Like, like up until I was like Six years old I would drink like Six, seven glasses Do you know what I'm saying? Who are you? See what the fuck I'm talking about? The Antichrist? Mm -hmm. Why do you have the Antichrist? And you know what he would do? You know what he would do With the milk? He'd take just a little A scoop of mayonnaise And put it in the milk <laughs> And then just little on, then just drink that shit. Um, but it's <laughs> like, <laughs> right, right. Oh my um, god! Do you like no, almond milk? No. He needs the whole white man milk. All right. That, yeah. That's not even. I'm not looking over there anymore. Right. Almond um, milk is amazing. But, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. So you were saying though, you buy, you buy the candies from. Oh yeah. So I buy. The, I don't. I didn't want the candy, so I just gave her like five dollars. I'm mm -hmm. like, Here, you know, just take it. And she's like, wait, my girlfriend loves you, mm. and like just. You we connect with people. People don't connect. Mm -hmm. There's a border between us. You know, like we we right. we have this just like a, a wall up. You know, like we we can say how are you doing, but we don't mean how are you doing. We don't care to listen for that response. Right. And we don't care to talk to people. So then I'm looking at her and I'm seeing in her eyes how happy that just made her. You know, mm -hmm. like not even one the fact that I just gave the money. I didn't care yeah. for the chocolate, but just the fact that I was having a conversation with her and she could feel me listening to her and speaking to her and just all those things. So I wish that was in our culture to be more like people, you know, like see each other as people instead of having that wall up. Yeah, well, I mean, it's difficult to see somebody as a person when you're trying to impress them. Yeah. You know what I mean? So when you're, when, when you're trying to impress somebody or let everyone know how smart you are, or how woke you are, how rich you are, how everything you are, it's very difficult to see somebody as a person and let them see you as a person um, when you're doing that. I think that my imperfections are so loud, right? Mm -hmm. They're so loud. Can I ask and a question? Sure. What do you feel like your imperfections are? Dog, everything. Listen. I mean, number one, I'm a pervert. I love <laughs> Okay. Porn. Never mind. I love Go back to what you were porn. saying. <laughs> what? What? I love I love I love new daring porn. I love different camera angles. I love any any <laughs> listen, any sort of um uh, what? Innovations in pornography, <laughs> like like I dig it. That's a, I you mean, watch the porn awards. Well, I, yeah, I watch. I've gone too. He went. Yeah, I, like he went. Yeah. I literally said I didn't know people. Go, I didn't go there. Yeah, okay. like, like yeah, go, like no. but those things. Uh, listen, by, by the way, that also used to be a coping mechanism for me. That's okay. why that you, right. that was a coping mechanism right. for me. I fell into a weird sort of porn and sex addiction, and now I have a handle on it. Now it's more of a recreational thing. I don't have as much time for it as I used to. Got a to. job. And Got such. a job. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Trying to keep it good at home. So I don't, I don't, um, I don't, I don't delve into it as much. I mean, there's that. There's narcissism. I mm -hmm. deal with. I deal with sometimes feeling like I have to be the smartest guy in the room. Mm -hmm. It's very tough for me. Um, I deal with issues of my spirituality. I deal with my uh, trying to figure out like what my purpose is or mm -hmm. what the purpose is yeah. or, you know, any of those things. And, you know, more than that, like, like hate in my heart that like has been built up over growing up in the deep South, deep South sometimes and, and seeing the way, uh, 
black and brown people have been treated and, and, and really wanting to change things, but at the same time feeling like you continuously go, you're, you're, you're running your head against a brick wall. Mm-hmm. And you just want people to, to, to realize mm-hmm. that, you know, like sometimes I, I think about the people that are really suffering. Yeah. And it makes me hard and it makes me rigid and it makes me not want to listen. It makes me not want to accept people. And mm-hmm. I have to check myself before I put that out there. Like even the thing that happened with, uh, with Kanye West, it's like so easy for me to be like, yo, fuck this man. Fuck what he's going through. Fuck everything that's happened to him. Mm-hmm. When a lot of the things that we're talking about, we know for sure that he's dealing with. Them. Yeah. And see, that's that's crazy because. I would I listen to both of his albums and I would t- like tell people like list please listen to the album because the things that he has to say mm-hmm. matter like he on one of the songs he says it's not it's not my bipolar that's my bipolar speaking it ain't no disability it's my superpower right. and like okay it's Kanye West and like I know he's going through these things so I just listen to it without putting the putting everything that he is onto that song and just trying to take the message in but also acknowledging the fact that okay the things that he's saying can influence a lot of hate that can influence a lot of it's bad just things hard for happen. me man it's, hard, it's really hard it's, it's hard for me because sometimes like you, you deal with the individual and what they're going through mm-hmm. but yo you know i'm i'm thinking about people that have raised me and put their life into me and put their soul into me that have told me listen there are these powers that are going to try to stop you from being your best mm-hmm. and if you don't stop them they'll do it to your kids and if you don't stop them from doing it to your kids, they'll do it to their kids. And at mm-hmm. some point, there's got to be some generation that says no to them. Yeah, stops it. That 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 stops that, and that that gets inside of me, and it and it can sometimes take me out of myself, you know. Yeah. So if I when I hear somebody empowering that, or when I hear somebody doing what I think is empowering that, it's hard for me to be empathetic. Yeah. And we have got to find empathy in all of these situations. So yeah, that's I tweeted that I was like, we as a as a general. As, I just feel like my generation and the generation after us will have a lot more empathy. Mm-hmm. We're learning to have empathy, empathy, but we're at a point where, just how you're saying, we're, we're so much anger in our hearts, yeah. and we don't want to listen. Like you know, like even even listening to the point of, I feel like you have to learn your enemy to know what, like to learn. You have to learn your enemy. Right. So like no one, a lot of, like they wouldn't listen to what he's saying. You, I'm not saying you have to agree with it, but you just have to hear it. So you know what it is and you know what to, how you're combating it. You know what I'm right. saying? And so it's just hard because there's it's it's hard because there's a thin line that you're fighting. You know, it's like yeah, how can I listen right. to someone that's literally that's talking going against bull- yeah. yeah, it's like why are you and especially with the fact that it's Kanye West. Mm-hmm. This is George Bush doesn't care about black people, Kanye West. Yeah, the same guy. And man. you're now George Bush in this situation, Kanye. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Wow. So it's, yeah, same shit. What do you what what do you feel like is specifically happening mental health wise to uh, your generation? You were born in 2012. So what, <laughs> like, what, like what, why do you have these slick what, jokes? What, like, and, what, then, <laughs> and then you try to talk fast. No, <laughs> no we're gonna acknowledge what, this. What, what do you? It seems like, um, especially with people that um, are in celebrity that come from your. Your age group, mm-hmm. like the, uh, I guess you're actually even probably after the millennials, really. Uh, that there's a lot of talk about mental health. There's a lot of talk about people being depressed. There's a lot of talk about people being angry and, and and sort of not finding themselves. Is this a symptom of something that specifically afflicts you guys, you you young people, or is this um, a sort of awakening of people being able to discuss these things? I think it's a mix of both. I think, <clears throat> uh, you know, we're just allowed to talk about it now. Right. You know, so it's like, okay, he said something about it, so I feel safe. And that's, like I said, that's why I do it, so people can feel safe. But also, I feel like we're at a gener- the generation we live in where it's really technology-driven. We're exposed to so much knowledge and so many things that are happening in the world that it puts it's, it's impossible not to... You either have to turn it off or you mm-hmm. you have to de- like you know it's trauma. We right. every time I go on Twitter, I'm seeing a black kid shot. I'm seeing black people. Yeah, that's tough. You know, what I'm saying it's hard not to be a black man and be fearful right. of my life. You know, what I'm saying and me being the black man I am, I'm, I don't even look. I don't fit the character of, of what white people are fearful of. Right. But still, me being a black man in America and and black children, a ten year old getting arrested and he's peed his pants. Right. You know, there's all of these things going on. So it's like, I feel like. 
the I have depression. an idea about that, by the way. What? I want to get it started right here. Okay. Thursday is happy shit day. What does that mean? What? Take a shit and Thursday, be happy? Thursday, that, 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 that shit that, makes you very... Yeah, taking a shit yeah, makes you very really happy. It really fixes your day. I you know, swear to God. Take a shit makes you... But it's like therapy. Every Thursday, what we should do uh-huh. is we should change the narrative on social media. This is not to get at anyone who posts videos that show black people um, in fucked up situations, right? Mm -hmm. We need to see them sometimes. We need to know the injustices that are happening. But I say that every (laughs) Thursday, (laughs) but I, (laughs) every Thursday, what we should do is our timeline should be filled with human beings who are achieving, human beings that are, I don't give a fuck if it's puppies, if it's kittens, remind each other that we're working on it. Mm -hmm. We don't have it figured out, but we're working on it. Good news Thursdays, all day long, no negativity zone. For one day, I promise you the world is not gonna stop spinning if we don't remind each other how fucking terrible it is. I I promise you, man, it'll be cool. I'm with it. I'm with it. That's all I ever do is post things like that. I, that's what you do. <laughs> but sometimes I'm in here posting videos of niggas getting fucked up at the Waffle House, hey, and like, I gotta Shit. stop myself. <laughs> I'm like, I, I gotta stop myself. I'm like, yo, <laughs> bro, let, let's let's post the kids graduating, and let's post people. You know what I'm saying? Like, and sometimes it gets a little tricky. Like, I try to post cool videos of people building robots, and I think, wait, is this a good thing? Because these robots can fuck us up one day. Yeah, so, 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 you know what I'm saying? So it's a I don't know. Yeah, it's conflicting, but. I get it. Like, that's very, very hard to be continuously uh, reinforced with that. Do you feel like um, your videos and your art and the stuff that you do, does that help you cope? Yeah, it does. Because, like, I've been doing this thing recently where I make videos and I just, I say a message and, like, whether it's inspiration or just something to myself. I say, it's like I'm speaking to myself, really. Mm -hmm. And I put the camera up and it's like I'm looking at a mirror and I'm telling myself these things. Right. But then I post the video and it's, me telling these people as well mm-hmm. so one of the videos and i dance I, I play a song i like and just sing mm-hmm. and like let all of it out but um one of the videos i when i went to sleep it was like the first day where i tried to go to sleep without any form of i have a very addictive personality so do i yeah so like i could get really addicted to a person and like mm-hmm. you know like say just like all of these things i get addicted to like drugs all these things like to help me with whatever it is it's right. so like Cause I, I I'm an escapist, right. so I run away from reality, you know. So um, most great creators do, by the way. Yeah, I'm hip. So yeah. I, when when I be going through stuff, like I be I'm great though. So I, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> this is a sign of greatness, right? But um, it was the first day where I was trying to go to sleep without smoking very frequently. You know, mm-hmm. like I would be with smoke, and then I'd be like roll another one, and my right. he'd be like, "Are you okay?" And I'm right. like inside, I'm like, "No," because right. I can't go to sleep without this. Right. But I have to be better than that. You know, like, there's not, I can't, and if I wouldn't smoke, then it's like, okay, but I'm taking a leave PMs. Mm-hmm. I don't have a cold, but I'm taking ZQuil or NyQuil, you know, like, to go to sleep because right. my mind is racing, cause, but it's like, out of, or going into out of it and things like that. Mm-hmm. But it was my first day of trying to sleep without it. And I was, when I woke up, I just didn't feel good. But now I made the video. And then when, in the midst of me making the video and me talking about it, it helped me. And then with posting it, it as well helped other people because they told them it let them know that they can do it as well. Right. So it's like, yeah, it's both. Yeah. Um, do you fuck your fans? No. You don't. No. Why? Is that not it's weird. No, it's weird. Why? They just get weird. I've met like fans in person, and they be trying and they be, to fuck. They be trying to fuck with me. I'd be like, all right, dog. Like I, that's not what I want to do. But then they're like, they're just weird. Like fans are clingy. Yeah. Like, I can't fuck a fan because sex makes. Things clingy, right? And then you're already meat clingy. Stick on them, yeah. and then they're gonna be clingy. <laughs> That's what you're trying to say. You hear him over here talking about it. You hear him over here talking about. They're gonna be clingy when I put this meat dick on them. You know what I'm saying? Like, why is that what we call it? That's what you that said. That sounds like you said meat <laughs> dick. That sounds like, like a I sponsored can't. deal, though. So you don't like because <laughs> because I, I, I've noticed that the fans be on there like me should me should put a picture up and it'd be like, oh my god, he's so. Beautiful, and it'd be like ten to fifty. I'd be like, man, Meech better wrap that shit up. It's gonna be a bunch of Meech village around here. I'm not kids. having no children, dog. I got things to do in my life. Children, no kids. 
Not, By the way, he's sweating now, so he's two. definitely fucking his fans. Do you see all of these like, lights like on he, me? Like he's, he's sweating now. He's definitely fucking. Someone his get a behind the scenes of all these lights on me. It's a lot but of lights. You see how I'm shining? Oh, yeah, I, 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 see I, you I right didn't show you this. This is my great grandmother. Oh, word, that's dope. And then this is my aunt. Oh, and then my um my uncle passed away last November in 2017, mm -hmm. and so he was diabetic, and so he had like a boot. So I got a boot for him. Wow. So these mementos now, have you learned? Like these are mementos of people that you lost. Yes. Have you learned to take these image, these these remembrances, these mementos, and use them as things to remind you of the good times and the light of these people, or do they still times sometimes remind you of the lives that you lost? No, it really reminds me of. Like you were saying, like the light and mm -hmm. the good times. Because like with the boot, the reason I got the boot is because my, like I said, he got his toes amputated. He got to have wear a boot. But I would be getting my hair cut and he, my dad cuts my hair. So mm -hmm. I would be down in the basement get my hair cut. Mm -hmm. It's a flight of stairs to get to the basement. So then my my uncle is like 6'5", 250 mm -hmm. pounds. So he'd be walking down the stairs. You and can he hear just, him. <laughs> and I'm looking at the boot and it's just... The first thing I see is a boot. Yeah. And it's just another, just, it just keeps up and down the stairs. So every time I look at the boot, I laugh. Right. Because it takes him forever to get down to this, the, the stairs. Mm -hmm. And he's like, <sighs> nephew. Ah, and it's like, ah, you know what I'm saying? So every time I, I think of it, I see that. And then this, uh, this was the last time I seen my great grandmother. So it's a really good picture for me because it reminds oh, me of it. And then this picture of my aunt is the first time when she first moved to California because she's from Detroit. Okay. So when she first moved to California, she took this picture. So then I got this um, after I came back home from coming to L.A. Mm. So it's like she's guarding over me. Like it just reminds me of good times. I want to ask you something, and I want to open it up to the room a little bit now. But by the way, who, who is this, Meech? Diana, my friend Diana. Diana, what's up? Is Diana on mic? G give give Diana a mic real quick. Is Diana on mic? You know she's not on mic. I didn't know. I didn't know if she was on mic or not. Diana, what's up? How you doing? You guys, I want to talk about something as a family right now. At the okay. family reunion. I want to talk about something as a family right now. I want to talk about, and we can all jump in on this together because there was a lot of debate on my social media this weekend about Beyonce showing her ass. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, is Lauren on awesome. mic? Oh. There's only one mic. There's only one mic we've took. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. So let's let's have this discussion right now, okay, about Beyonce's ass because I never knew that, that Beyonce one. Had ass? I, not that Beyonce did. Did I, did I tell you about my? Uh, you knew. Yeah, you knew. You knew. Yeah, I knew that Beyonce ah. had ass since uh, since way back in the day. But are y'all? I want to ask the community, the family. Are y'all this offended by somebody's ass, man? I why did you love it, Lauren? I oh, I know why you loved it, but go ahead. <laughs> I brought it up at brunch because I just feel like... At brunch? I'd be yes. so mad. I'd be eating, no. talking about ass. <laughs> no, I'd friends, be pissed. My friends knew why because I feel like people are so quick to be like, you either have to be super sexy and not be successful because you're intelligent and you're like savvy and you are knowledgeable and educated mm -hmm. or you're educated and you're all the other stuff and not super sexy. It's like one of the other... There's no like sexy i have a nice body i can do what i want but i'm also very smart and i run my own business yeah and i have my hand on a bunch your of question. things that's your question why do you even have to have your own business what if you unemployed and you want to show your ass okay is it any worse then no no all i'm saying show is, your ass if you want to show, show it. if you if you are sexy at any point as a female people automatically discredit your intelligence or your ability to do things but be sexy i feel you and that blows me i hate that i just feel like it's there's no, Ooh, there's no like <laughs> intersection of the two. Mm -hmm. oh, come on. I'm just saying, you mad, man. Yeah. Like, like, you, like people been leaving comments on your shit, huh? I've been with people for so long. No, I have gotten like comments on my Instagram, like, cause I swimsuit model and people, <laughs> I've literally have gotten people say to me, what is your problem? Oh my God, no. Who raised you? You have a brain. I'm like, you know, I still have a brain, which is helping me read this message that you took your time to write me too. Like, just because I took a picture doesn't mean I don't have a brain. I just Word. like it because <laughs> people, they love to make Beyonce this like super can't do any wrong. And when she did that, no one could say anything. But when Kim no, Kim they did say it because I post. Listen, I posted the picture of her, and shout out to Jay because you a brave motherfucker, homie. Like I posted the picture of of her and Jay where you can see the ass, right? That other picture, I don't like the other picture. I don't like the other Somebody picture. said, I never wanted to see this much of Jay-Z, like, no, 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 and I 100% no, 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 agree. The other like, picture was, was a little bit. No one lays hold, like hold that. What is that about? A hold is a goat. Hold is a goat. But come on, man. Weird, that that picture was a little bit. It was weird. It was like, yeah. <laughs> I I, like, it was it was made me feel uncomfortable. Yeah. All right? But the other picture, I liked it. I just said, the only thing I said, my only critique of the picture was that, 
Yo, maybe this would have been one where Jay Z could have got out this picture and just let Beyonce be great. He really you know what I'm saying? Just, just, just for like one second. You know the Beehive hates Jay Z. Every time, ev- oh, it's the funniest thing. Every time he comes on stage, if you like look at the live tweets, mm-hmm. like say when she did, uh, I, I don't remember if he came out during Coachella, but like whenever he comes out, they're like, why he, why she bring this nigga? And they, this just, nigga is Jay Z, but they don't like him because he <laughs> cheated on Beyonce. And they. They Man, won't look, forgive him. They they got over it. They no, they didn't. Dog. That's what no, I got. I'm saying, I'm saying Beyonce and Jay got over it. My oh, thing yeah. is, and I, I I put the picture up there, and I'm thinking, you know, this is Beyonce's ass. It looks it looks great. She's a mother and a, and, a, and an entity and a brand. And there's people in there like, she just like Kim Kardashian. Now I can't believe that she did this. And I'm thinking to myself like, wait. First of all, a couple things. Beyonce been shaking her ass for so long since she first came out. I will never forget this. I'm gonna put I'm gonna put everybody on this. Are you you're the ass kind of sewer? Yes, I'm gonna put everybody on this. There was a concert, and this the concert really- was called Beyonce and Friends. All right, this concert happened in Detroit. It was like 2003 or 2004. It was right after Crazy in Love pop dropped. It was Beyonce, and she was on stage with the rest of Destiny's Child. And this day, Beyonce forgot her stockings. So she's up there shaking that ass, oh and the dress is popping up. What is and wrong she's with in a you? thong. I'll never forget this. I've, is, I've tried to search for it on YouTube since then. Diana, don't go nowhere. Because uh, I got to get your opinion on this. Sit back, sit, sit back down. But what I'm saying is, I say all that to say that A, I'm a sad human being, but B, that Beyonce has always embraced her sexuality. Diana, as a woman, uh-huh. were you offended? Because we know Lauren don't care because she's thinking about her own agenda. But like yeah. as as a as a woman, were you offended by Beyonce's boot booty? Yeah. Yeah. No, why? Like I don't get it. it so was, I was happy about this. You yeah. like you you was happy about it? Of You're course. Guy though. <laughs> but like I was what happy did, in the sense of the same way. Like I didn't care, but I was happy. Like I thought of in the sense of that because it's like people do use Beyonce. Like oh you you either have to be Beyonce or Kim Kardashian, and when they 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 dumb it down. To and that. Anytime she stepped but, out of that, like. I don't even, it's like this pedestal. Anytime she steps beyond that, they're like, oh my God, Beyonce, why? And it's just like, she, at the end of the day, you can't say anything. She can do whatever the fuck she wants. Wait, yes. but what if you are Kim Kardashian? Why but why does it matter? Yeah, why why does so it matter why women I'm do really with their body? What, what you do I don't care. I don't, I don't, I don't care. We like against it. Kim Kardashian. <laughs> <laughs> I think that people in this, like, people are probably going to say whatever they're going to say in the comments about this statement, but people don't understand that what Kim Kardashian does by displaying her body the way she does and the angles and all that, that is not not everybody can do that if they could they would be kim kardashian she is herself because of the way she can do it and people are upset about it lauren but if you she, could switch places with kim kardashian right now would you oh i'll be walking out of here with kanye nigga i have a switch <laughs> place with kim kardashian <laughs> so everything so everything that it entails being kim kardashian i mean all of it i mean look you, hey, <laughs> that's what I, right. um diana i want you to tell us about uh, you and meet your friends how long y'all been friends a year Tell us, tell me, tell me, tell us about Meech. Why is Meech so special? Why do people? Yeah, <laughs> do that. <laughs> um, how do you mean? Like, why is he so special? Like, when any anytime somebody repeats the question, yeah, <laughs> you about to make something up now. I'm that means I'm they special. don't have a good answer. She like this nigga. All right. <laughs> 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 why? But why do? Why do? Why do? Like he has a. He just gave me a sweatshirt, and the sweatshirt says, "You matter." He matters to a lot of people. Why does mm-hmm. he matter to them? I think because he just brings so much light and joy into the world that you don't really see very often Mm -hmm. um, in people that you meet for the first time. And when you meet him for the first time, it's just like, even though he does go through a lot and he does, all of us battle with our own demons, but he like, he makes, I don't, I don't know. I, he's very, put me on the spot. Okay. (laughs) Um, That's where you are. The spot is called the spot. (laughs) (laughs) Um, yeah, this just, has been great, though, to be honest with you. He just has a huge heart filled with, like, le- like when you see the way he treats his friends and, like, just the small gestures that he does, like, it's just filled with so much love and it's so genuine mm-hmm. that you don't see it that much like, as you do, like, nowadays. Like, everybody is out for themselves, like, mm-hmm. oh, I have to get mine or whatever. But yeah. he has his, and he knows that he has his. And he Danny, chooses to share. you know what else share. is huge? Hmm. 
Beyonce's ass. <laughs> <laughs> it's gigantic. What is wrong with you? There's nothing. I, I'm really <laughs> obsessed with this. I wanted to get that answer in there from Diana. Her panty choice was great too. But the the, the panties were the panties were great. It was, it the, was. the panty choice. Listen, the panty choice what made it really because I was like, yeah. okay, I see how you rock it. I, I have a question seriously <laughs> to the whole room. If there was nothing to be mad about, wouldn't we invent shit to be mad at? Yes. Don't, yeah. Don't uh, don't 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 we don't we just tell me, tell me every, I mean, every, why do we do that? Why everything do we is a yin and yang. About? Everything is a yin and yang. That's my hypothesis. You need good to know what bad is. You need mad shit to be about so you can have happy. But shit we don't to be need about. to invent shit to be mad about. Because so it, much shit to like, be mad about wait. already. How you gonna be mad about Beyonce's ass? Because niggas don't have nothing going on in their life, dog. They don't. They don't have that going on, and they're really invested in these people. I get it. I listen. I'm not going to say I'm not invested in Beyonce and Jay-Z. I guess I'm invested as much as I can be invested in to people that I've only briefly met. But like, you meet Beyonce? Hold on. Huh? When you meet Beyonce? I didn't really meet her, but I All smelled right. her. She walked by. <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you? She walked by and I was like... Does she know that? <sighs> That's Beyonce right there. <laughs> um, but what I would say is... How does Beyonce smell? She smells... Beyonce smells like... Like a future of America, like she smells. Beyonce smelled great. That Beyonce smells lie. like the Dream Martin Luther King. She hat. smells like the Dream Martin Luther King hat. Exactly. <laughs> like I met her, she was in Urban Outfitters. This was years ago. To let you know, it was years ago. I smells like, oh my God, Beyonce. Yeah. Um. But uh. But seriously, like it, it, I was when I think about like all of the stuff that's going on, I was like, people were gonna, like, I'm look, I'm gonna look at my my Instagram right now. And I'm gonna tell you how many comments a fucking picture of Jay Z and Beyonce has on the Instagram. That picture of Jay Z and Beyonce like is really awkward. It really bothers me. It haunts me actually. Like it's it's like the picture has yeah, the one where he's, the, the, and, he's I, and, I, and, I, and my Instagram is my yeah, my Instagram weird. is not all popping like that. No one lays like that. But this is still a lot of comments. It has fifteen hundred and thirty eight comments. And I'm not my pop is I'm not, I'm not saying I'm popping like that. What I'm just saying is hey, that what are you talking about? You are really, that's fifteen hundred. That's a thousand. Huh? Yeah, but what I'm saying is, why would that? And there's a lot of people in there. Cause I made a joke. That's that's mad. Like, why are we inventing shit to be pissed about? Like, why there, there's so much shit to be pissed about? I feel like we're going the opposite way. That it, th there's a time where we know these things that we could be angry about. We could actually take our time to be invested into things that matter. But yet we're getting invested into the most trivial things. And I'm trying to figure out what that's about. Do you have any insight for me, Meech? I don't know. I'd be I I'd, I'd be I was scrolling on something, and you ever like. Click on a quote tweet that leads to another quote tweet to another quote tweet to another quote tweet. Yeah, I was like three quote tweets in. I was like, "Why the fuck do I care about this?" And I just backed <laughs> out. I was like, "This does nothing for me." Like right. I, I've reached that point of just not caring anymore. I don't know why. I it, it perplexes me actually because I don't yeah. understand what value these things hold to people and why people people genuinely be pissed like Man. writing essays like you don't even understand what's good like in really be like invested about Beyonce's ass and then the next day they're investing something else. Yeah. I yeah. guess people just have an overload of energy that they need to put somewhere. It's true. Um, brother, I'm going to ask you this. What's popping? You are 20 years old. Just yes. made 20. Um, what do you want to be? Where do you want to go professionally? And then mentally, all the things that you've been with, that, that, you, that, you've, that you've dealt with, all the, uh, the low and the high places that you have been, What's because there are a lot of people dealing with this. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, there are a couple of different. We try to have fun on the podcast, but we also want to give people, we want to nourish people a little bit. There's, we've been talking mm -hmm. about mental health. Um, we touched on it a couple of different podcasts and stuff like that. But there are a lot of people dealing with this. I want you to get to where you want to be because you moved out to LA just recently. Yeah, um, this is my. I moved out. 2016 of December, December right. 2016. So I'm assuming that's about something professionally, but like, as far as you, what what would be your idea of being happy? Why don't you answer that first? What would be your idea of being happy, of being in a good place mentally? So like when I visualize happiness, yeah, I'm happy right now. Where? Like I I don't think I forgot what the exact quote is, but happiness is not a destination. You know, like you don't have to go towards happiness. It's not like I don't ever think I'm gonna. I never think I'm gonna be happy for the rest of my life. Something's gonna happen, like you know, it's a balancing act. Like I was saying with the yin and yang, because there's gonna be good days and there's gonna be bad days. But I just learned to live with both of them, accept them as they come, 
And I, I said something to Diana in that regard, and that's become my favorite quote. I just said it out of thinking, but like not smiling through your pain, but smiling with it. You know, like I acknowledge that I've that there's gonna be more loss. I'm gonna someday my mother is gonna die, and I'm gonna have to deal with that. You know, someday my father is gonna pass, and I'm gonna have to deal with that. But I also have the times with them now. You know, like mm. there's happiness in everything. It's just about seeing it, and as well as there could be sadness and everything mm. is that your sort of your your message to your peers and stuff because you know like we talk about like even with the we're seeing a fresh rash of suicides from people who would have ever thought that anthony bourdain would yeah. take his own life you know what i mean people like that like um is there anything specifically about your experiences with depression with being suicidal that you can impart into somebody that might be listening to this podcast that's dealing with the same thing is there any one thing is there any one method like what is it it was really hard for i don't even know how i got to the point of where i am now mm -hmm. like i i gave a speech i just they gave a graduation commencement speech and i was telling him i was i opened up to him about me being suicidal and how like i found my purpose you know like my purpose was making people smile regardless if that was through the videos or not you know like i carry i'm when the videos go off it's not like i just turn into this mean person you know i'm the same person everywhere when i see people and I, they speak to me i speak to them back and if they want to have a conversation, I'm open to it, stuff like that. But I don't know. I just, it sounds really cliche to say because the best, the most true things and the best things, advice in life that someone could give you sounds cliche because you hear it very frequently. But believe, like, believe, genuinely believing that it will get better, better, you know, like, and not being naive, like, oh, this would just go away, you mm -hmm. know, and understanding that, <clears throat> You know, I, I've I dealt with the being suicidal, and I, like I recently, I recently I was clean from cutting for I don't know how many years, and then I cut again in summer of 2017. And you know, like even with that, like I didn't beat myself up about it. I realized like this is okay. This is your not your fault, but you know, like this happened. It's nothing I could do about this except for moving forward to the next day. You know, we try to think in a sense of. The f so far ahead in the future you know we think of today is a bad day so tomorrow's gonna be a bad day and this is the worst day and we can't get out of this darkness and it's so hard to deal with it because it's our it's our mind and our mind is what's telling us this so it's hard to flip our mental but i would believe that if we learn to to view life differently we learn to accept that thing bad things will happen but it won't be like that forever you know and it's very hard to think of in a sense but no happy like no happy moment has ever lasted forever so why do we think the bad moments will mm. just because the bad moments feel like forever and the happy moments feel like a second fleeting yeah, yeah. so it's really it's a balancing act and but it's about believing genuinely believing in it you know like and not just saying okay it'll get better but genuinely believing like one day it will maybe not tomorrow maybe not wow. two months but. i'll tell you what you are the deepest <laughs> wisest toddler that i have ever stop talking to me met <laughs> how old are you man how old are you i'm 38 that's crazy yeah <laughs> <laughs> you are the deepest and wisest infant all right we're gonna get him out of here man wait i had to answer another question my career oh yeah your career my bad my bad go ahead bro i gotta put myself on you know yeah uh, yeah I moved out here to be an actor. Sure. And I, I realized I wanted to do that when I was in high school, and I was really upset about it because I was like, wow, I could have been taking theater class, all this stuff. That's when I did, like, the Beyonce video. Really, the Beyonce video and, like, around the era is when I was like, I could do this, you know, because mm -hmm. that's when I stopped using my camera and my front camera. I started, like, recording, actually. But I want to be a poet, mm -hmm. a published author um, with my poetry books, but as well as, like, writing literature, um, creative director as far as photo shoots, music videos, everything else regarding that a screenwriter mm -hmm. um and an actor as well i still want to be an actor mm. but i would love to like act in my own things first do, yeah. or did you does your videos you make money off of them and stuff like that yeah but i i stopped doing as much as i used to because youtube is horrible with youtube is horrible All right youtube is horrible like, as, at the moment just as far as like how they treat their creators right. and how they've reacted to um there was like a really big ad strike I don't know if you guys know about that. I do. Yeah, so with that, with the aftermath of that has really messed up the YouTube community. A lot of, a lot of creators left YouTube just because they're... You know, Patron or anything like that? Like <laughs> it was like Coke and all of it. What's the, what's the name of that? Is it? I called it Patron. What's the name of that site where you go on? Patron. 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 Yeah. 
Oh, Pat- Patreon. Patron. I thought you. What was the on fuck it. is wrong with you? I was like, we're on the Patron, man. You go. I, somebody like like follow me on Patron, and you get what you give like ten dollars a month, and you get to create your own stuff and people yeah, support shit you. like that. And so, but I, I mean, I'm not on that, but you know, like I don't. I'm very. I don't care for money more so. Okay. So like I've 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 had my clothing brand since seventh grade. Eighth grade, I was making ten thousand dollars a month. Ninth grade, I wasn't anymore. What? Ten thousand a month. I'm a genius. <laughs> <laughs> I say very humbly. That's dope, bro. Thank ten thousand a month. God damn. But so with that, that all of that was gone because I just blew my money on that. But like, I don't care for money in the sense of, I'll give my last dollar to someone because it doesn't matter to me. I have enough money for myself. You know, mm-hmm. like the money, the amount of money I have right now is more than I need for myself. So I give it away mm-hmm. very frequently, you know, and I don't care to create for money. I don't care to do these things for money. I do it because I love doing it. Mm. I love to create, but I need the money too. The money matter. Yeah, it yeah. do. But like, I'm not going to let man. that be my everything. It's not, it's not going to be everything. I'll say this and I don't believe. <laughs> Are you going to walk away from your own pockets? Nah, man. I saw these off-whites. Ooh. Which ones? The, the, the covers? The, the, nah, the, covers. the, the Jordan off white. Oh, yeah, those are crazy. I did this thing and Eric Blesso. Shout out to Eric Blesso and Rudy Gay and all these NBA niggas who got real money and hanging around them. I think I'm dope because I got a pair of Air Force Ones. These niggas coming with the off whites hurting my head. I got to have them. I'm going to get them off Which whites. color is it? The blue they ones just, or the they, red they, ones? They, they were just white. They were white off whites. Oh, the, the all George. white ones? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're not getting those, dog. I'm getting them. Well, you can, yeah, but. I'm getting them. <laughs> I'm a national treasure. No, I'm just joking. Um, all right, everybody in the room, man, what an enlightening conversation. What a brave conversation. What a relatable conversation from this young man. I'm telling you, bro, I like we, I reached out to you back in the day because... I really appreciate that, too. Yeah. You, you, you reached I, out to me in 2016. It's yeah, 2018. I'm I was, finally here. I was moved by what you were doing, man, and I know that there's more in store for you. Give it up for, for Demetrius Harmon, everybody. All right. That's the Red Pill Podcast.